Well, welcome to episode 46 of the Huntback Country podcast, presented by Exo Mountain Gear. Tonight's topic is certainly a timely one. We're talking all about meat care. So in your backcountry hunts in the coming weeks and months, you might be faced with a situation where, hopefully, you get something down, and maybe you're far out back. What do you do? How do you take care of this animal? How do you get the most meat home? Specifically, we cover the best tactics to use in the heat for you guys who are hunting in the early seasons. So we not only talk about you know the deboning process, the packing process, we also cover some tactics on how to get that meat back home, especially for you guys like myself who travel quite a ways to get into your hunting grounds. The guest tonight is David Draper. He is a freelance outdoors writer, has written for Field and Stream and Outdoors Life, all kinds of places. He really kind of specializes in the meat side of things, so everything from meat care to recipes, which we get into a little bit as well. Um, He's just super knowledgeable. We had an awesome conversation. I know that you guys are going to enjoy this one. If you do enjoy the episode, can you go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes? Or if you have any other questions, comments, or feedback, send us an email to podcast at exomountaingear.com. That's what Jeremy Blanchard did, and Jeremy, you were this week's Exo Mountain Gear swag giveaway winner. So Jeremy, thanks for the email, for the feedback, and for the questions. Listeners, please send that to us, and you'll be entered into these giveaways. Okay, meat care, on to the episode with David Draper. Enjoy. All right, well, David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening. Yeah, Mark, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be on and, and talk all things backcountry hunting, which is one of my favorite things to do. Absolutely. So for our listeners who are unaware of your name, but who have most likely in some way um, been exposed to your work, can you kind of kind of give us a background on who you are, what you do, and kind of how you're involved in the hunting industry? Yeah, for sure. So um, I live in western Nebraska near the headquarters of Cabela's, and I actually worked for Cabela's for 12 years as a communication specialist, uh, did PR for them and uh, corporate communications, that sort of fun stuff, avid hunter my whole life. And then I just decided one day to break off on my own and become a freelance writer. So um, your your listeners have probably seen my byline somewhere along the line because I, I freelance write for most outdoor publications, uh, Bow Hunter, Bow Hunting World, Field and Stream is probably my biggest market. I do a lot of work for Field and Stream. Uh, write a, a blog for them called Wild Chef. And then I also write the Fair Game cooking column for Peterson's Hunting and contribute quite a bit of work to Peterson's Hunting as well. So those are my main markets. But like I said, I write for just about anybody. So that's probably where people have come across me, hopefully. Yeah. yeah and as you mentioned, it's obviously all kinds of hunting, but then you have a, a particular focus and interest on the on the meat and on the food and the preparation and care. And that's kind of what we're here to talk about tonight. I'm kind of interested, did you come from sort of any sort of cooking background or what kind of got you more invested into that side of things? No, not not really. I mean, I, I worked some food service in college, like a lot of folks did, front of house mostly. Um, but I've always loved to eat, man. I, I just love food. Um, and I, I'm, I always tell people, I'm not a great cook. I just love to eat good food. So therefore, I, I do what I can to make the food that I cook good. Um, <laughs> so no real hardcore or, or training on on cooking, but just learn on the fly. And and um, I'll tell you a quick story. I shot my first, I didn't. I was I was a bird hunter growing up. My dad was a waterfowl hunter, so I always hunted waterfowl. Uh-huh. Didn't big game hunt till in college college and shot my first deer, uh, took it to a meat processor, got it back, and it was virtually inedible. I mean, it just, and I don't know what, what, what it was. It was my handling in the field, if it was the, if it was the meat processor or somewhere in between. I mean, I could, I choked that deer down because I had to, but I mean, my girlfriend wouldn't even be in the house if I was cooking it. That's how bad it smelled. And a lot of it was cooking too, because I didn't know that about overcooking meat, game meat. Right. And, and so a few years later, I had an opportunity to, to, to take another deer and, and, I just made it, took it upon myself. Like I'm going to butcher, it. I'm going to take this thing from the field to table myself. I butchered it myself with the help of some good friends that had, that had, that were big game hunters. And from that point on, I, I've really just been passionate about learning more about it. And I'd love it. Nothing more when someone says, Oh, that, you know, duck or antelope or whatever. So that's not edible. You can't eat that. And to, to prove them wrong. I mean, that's kind of always been my mission to take those less, uh, the ones with bad reputations, those foods with game meats with bad reputations and show people just how great they can really be. Yeah. Well, I'd love to, I, we'll get to that for sure, kind of talking about <laughs> some of the things yep. that go wrong and the the quote-unquote gaminess of meat and what we might 
be doing wrong to um, to not induce gaminess, but to not take good care of our meat and get the best out of it. But yeah. let's kind of start um, just to whet the appetite a little bit. So you are on an elk hunt, let's say, and have the good fortune of, of getting something down. And before we start talking about you know, caring for the meat in the field and then transporting it, which we're going to dive into. I want to know what's the, what's the meal that you make in the field? What's the piece of meat uh, that you're going to take from this elk and cook it up in the field? And then how are you going to prepare that? Um, that's, I mean, that's probably just going to be the tenderloin. And a lot of the time, I shouldn't say a lot of time, but in the, in the occasion, though, I've had the opportunity to, to do just that. It's nice to man, start a little nice little fire right there next to the, to the carcass, to the animal that's laying there and honor it by cooking a tenderloin right there over a fire made of whatever sticks and twigs you can come together. For one thing, it's probably going to be late at night. It seems like recoveries are always yeah. late at night for me. Yeah. And, uh, I'm usually starving cause I've been on a blood trail for a little bit or hunting hard. Exactly. And so, man, it's, it's nice to pull those tenderloins out real quick and just get them and for one thing you don't want tenderloins to age anyway because they're such a soft cut and um they're small so if they if they dry out a little bit you're going to have to skin that that harder skin on the outside off you know that that mm-hmm. dried portion so you're going to lose some so i think it's best to eat those as soon as possible and plus everything just tastes so much better when you're in the field and you're still on that adrenaline high from from everything that happened that led up to you uh, killing that animal for sure nothing beats fresh tenderloin yeah that, that that's true you know i'm not the biggest tenderloin fan in the in the outside world just because it's too tender for me i like my meat with a little more bite and it's not the most flavorful cut it but man something about it in the woods it's pretty special yeah i agree do you pack anything any sort of seasoning or oil for that occasion i mean you sort of prepared for that meal or you just pretty much cook it over the fire as is and enjoy it just if, if I remember, it doesn't happen very often. I'll throw like a little tiny backpacking salt and pepper shaker in my backpack, um, yeah. you know, in my day pack. But usually I don't have that with me. It's been on a rare occasion where I actually think, oh, I have a little – because a little salt goes such a long way toward making things just, you know, bringing out that flavor a little bit. So a little pinch of kosher salt would be great. But re- usually it's just the smoke from whatever green wood I can get. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. which isn't the best seasoning but it somehow works in that situation yeah and like you said after you've been hunting hard and following the blood trail and just the celebration of success i mean it's going to taste good regardless right exactly and 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 during the field dressing process or you know and getting that meat off the bone and into a pack i i i have I'll spend a lot of time just cutting off a tiny little slice and eating that as I go. I mean, it just kind of fuels you a little bit, gets a little bit of that animal soul inside you. I don't want to be, get too spiritual, but you know, I, I, I'm not opposed to eating a raw, a, a chunk of raw elk when I'm in the field, and and I do it a lot when I'm when I'm butchering any animal in the field. Just cut off a little slice and chew on it a little bit, and just keep going to work. And that way you're that way you're not going to bonk too much. You're probably going to bonk anyway. Yeah, <laughs> but, but uh, not too much as long as you're getting a little protein in you as you go. Yeah. That's that's new to me. I've actually heard of guys doing that, but it's something that I have not done. Hopefully yeah, I get the yeah. opportunity to do that here in about five weeks. I hope so too. I hope I get the opportunity in about two weeks. I'm heading out. Are you really? <laughs> yeah. Where yeah. to? Uh, actually, British Columbia, very far north British Columbia oh, for an elk man. hunt. So, wow. yeah, I, I'm pretty jacked. It's, I've hunted uh, British Columbia a couple times for bear, but this will be my first elk hunt up there, and it's a it's a pretty uh, pretty extensive hunt. Five plane rides just to get to the camp. Really? So, <laughs> from from home to uh, the the camp is five different plane rides. Wow. Okay, so we so, have to digress a, a yeah, bit yeah, here. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to hijack the <laughs> no, hijack no, the it's great. Here. <laughs> it's great. So, I mean. What's the, cause you know, I think BC and I think a sheep country, right? Yeah. I mean, what's, yep. what's it going to be like where you're hunting elk? It, it, up it here? is. It's exactly what it is. I'm going to be in sheep country, but I'm going to be a, below the timberline, just below the sheep. The camp okay. we're going to, uh, uh, it's Prophet Musqua is pretty famous for their sheep, um, and moose. And they actually have elk up there as well. So I'm going after elk. A guy that I'm going with is going after moose and elk bull. So, really? um, yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it's going to be some cool country and it's my first time that far north. So it, it'll be a, a new experience for me. So yeah. So I guess their season's kicking off earlier, um, probably has to do with the fact that they're further north, right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, their season starts August uh, 15th, which I think is the day I arrive. I leave here on the 14th, and I think I get into camp either the 15th or 16th. It's a long, I mean, it's a long haul to get up there, just the, you know, the flights and staying overnight and catch your next flight the next morning. Um, And it's actually, you know, what's what's kind of, what's kind of exciting about it is I, I love to hunt elk during the rut it's probably one of my favorite things to do next to waterfowling like i said that's my that's my passion two things that i get a call to the animal at um and but it's a rifle hunt so that i get a, even the odds a little bit for all the times i've eaten my bow tag <laughs> wow 
<laughs> that, wow. So, yeah. So, we might have that, to get you back on just to talk about this hunt. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would love to follow up with you. I'm gonna, you know, hopefully, hopefully I have a good story to tell and not a sad one, but either way, it'll be an incredible hunt. Either yeah, way it'll be incredible. For sure. So. All right, man, that's cool. So, so speaking of hunting early, um, and thinking of what most of us are going to be doing here in about, you know, five weeks or so, four or five weeks, um, heading out to the Rockies out West, um, hunting elk, hunting mule deer. Let's talk a bit about meat care specifically for the earlier season, the archery season when temperatures have the chance, sometimes even the probability of being quite high. Yeah, if um, there's one, if there's one downside to archery elk season is it's is the timing of it. I mean, that's it's yeah. just obviously that's the it's the nature of it because that's when they're in the rut and that's when they're doing their thing. But man, it's tough battling those hot temperatures. I mean, it's the scariest thing when you get an animal down and it's warm out. I mean, it's just it's so frightening. Yeah. So I would actually want to pull some points from an article that you wrote and kind of go through this because it's such a good breakdown and outline. Mm -hmm. You talk about, you know, taking care of meat in the heat. First things first, you want to bone immediately, bone the meat. Um, in all likelihood, use the, the gutless method. You want to talk about airing the meat out and seasoning it and then maybe treating it. So those kind of mm -hmm. five steps. So let's just kind of go through those if we can start with that first thing first and you mentioned specifically boning the meat out versus leaving it on the bone so kind of talk a bit about why that's so important when the temperatures are warmer and how that affects the meat when we bone it out versus leaving it you know it's like a whole elk quarter yeah yeah and <clears throat> i mean if i had my druthers and the, and the weather was cool enough and i was close enough where i could get that that meat to hang in a in a cool place i would leave it on the bone because it's preferable um a lot of guys don't realize that uh when an animal and i'll try not to get in too detail but when an animal goes Good into rigor details, mortis, yeah when an animal goes into rigor mortis um those those proteins and those and those muscle strands tighten tighten way up and when they're on the bone after 12 to 16 hours maybe less maybe eight hours because they're still attached to the bone, they'll stretch back out. So what results then is when you do get the meat off the bone a day later, it's more tender. If you if you butcher it on the bone while they're still in rigor mortis, those those tendons and those muscles, uh, muscle fibers don't have a chance to stretch back out, and you'll end up with a tougher tougher cut. So so that's if I had my druthers, I would always leave it on the bone. But mm -hmm. obviously. If it's, I mean, I was, we all, all cut in the book cliffs in 2013 and it was 80 degrees during the day and 60 at night. I mean, the worst elk hunting conditions you can imagine. It was mm -hmm. just so, so hot. Um, and I just knew if I got a bull down, I didn't, but if it would have had to, I mean, you have to get that meat off the bone because that bone sour, those bones hold so much heat, especially on a big animal like an elk. The, that meat close to the bone is going to stay hot for way too long and it's going to start rotting from the inside out. So yeah, um, if you don't even have to pull it off the bone, if you if you think you want to leave it on the bone, and, and sometimes bone meat's easier to pack out too, um, just because that not it's heavier obviously, but it's the just structure. easier to handle. Yeah, exactly. It's easier to handle a, a quarter. Um, but just take and, and make a big deep slice all the way to the bone through the meat, um, all the way down the length of that femur. It, it just lets that heat out, and you're going to be a lot better off. Yeah. So you're in effect venting the meat. You're giving it more surface area, I guess, to. Um, get access to the relatively cool temperatures i mean even if it's you know 70s or 80 out that's cooler than what that meat's going to be otherwise the contained bo at the bone, bone. Exa right? yeah exactly i mean i don't i don't know exactly what the what an elk's internal temperature is when it's alive but it's pretty hot so yeah i mean we've um, all felt that, it it's warm exactly exactly yeah. so uh, it, you're right if it's 80 degrees out you can expose as much of that meat and, and vent vent that heat out um you're still going to be better off even if it's hot out so. okay so you mentioned um, bone rot, a phrase that most of us probably heard of, but mm -hmm. certainly made me think of wanting to address something um, right away, and that is how do we identify, and maybe this is when we get home and we're processing things ourselves, but how do we identify when meat's gone bad? And that sounds I like mean, a dumb question, yeah. right? Like we all, we all know it yeah. when we see it in some instances, but I think there's always mm -hmm. maybe some questionable, like whether that's an off coloration or what have you. I mean, kind of speak to... You know, if it is it got that gray hint and it's okay yeah. versus something that's, you know, truly bad meat that needs to be trimmed away. 
Yeah, and I think that your number one, like you said, you can look at it visually and you can feel it sometimes. It's a, it gets to be a little slick as that bacteria kind of starts breaking down the surface. It gets slimy. But it, your number one indicator is your nose. I mean, you're going to know when that's bad. I mean, I mean it's just going to smell. I mean, it's, I've unfortunately had the occurrence a few times where it's like you you have that meat. You thought you took care of it, you know, it's, but whatever. You just open up a meat bag or something and you get a whiff and it's the, it's just makes your heart drop. And so then what I do is pull, you know, if it's a meat bag, I pull every piece out and just, you know, I jam my nose into every piece of meat and try to find where that where that's going sour at. And a lot of times it, it's it's near the surface. And so you can just trim that away until you get some good clean meat. And, and you know, there's always almost always a green tinge to it. Or like you said, a little bit of gray. Gray meat doesn't bother me as much as a, a, a shiny green tinge, an iridescence almost. It starts to get a little a little iffy. But like I said, it's it's the nose nose, I guess you'll say. Yeah, perfect for sure. Okay, so you mentioned um, the gutless method as well as being a, a good approach to use, especially, you know, obviously since we're um, deboning the meat anyway, that lends itself to the gutless method working really well. What other advantages do you feel that the gutless method offers? I just feel like it's cleaner. I mean, ever since I learned it, it's been a revelation. It, it just, you, you, it's cleaner. You're not exposing that meat to all that bacteria. Um, you know, hopefully you made a good shot and the, and the, the guts or the stomach's not punctured. Um, but there's always the threat of that when you're using, getting your knife in there and doing some trimming away. I mean, you got to be careful. So it just, it just feels like to me, you, you keep your meat a lot cleaner if you do it the gutless method rather than getting in there and cutting open the body cavity and, and having the threat of everything from urine to, to stomach contents to whatever to contaminate your meat yeah and i guess you know any of those contaminants plus heat is a double whammy right yeah yeah exactly i mean it's you got what you're wanting to do is just keep any type of bacteria away from that meat that you can and and you know bacteria thrives between 40 degrees and 140 degrees so your goal is to get that meat below 40 degrees if possible i mean obviously it's it's rarely possible to get it that cold but as long as you get some air circulation on it and get it as cool as you can as fast as can you're you're really going to be better off in the long run and you're going to have a better meal when you get back home too so sure yeah, it's interesting being uh, from the Midwest myself and growing up hunting whitetails and then talking with guys here. You know, I didn't learn the gutless method till I became an elk hunter and like you, it just felt like such a revelation, right? And so yeah. I've, I've shown it to guys here at home and even used it on whitetails here. And it's it's amazing for, for, get, for guys to see it. You know, it's like not even on the radar and they're like, how yeah. come I didn't know anything about this? Like even... Even if you are hunting whitetails and have, you know, good access to get it cooled quick, it's still mm -hmm. in many ways a really good method just to take care of things. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I probably big game hunted for 10 years before and it was all, you know, uh, deer and antelope. And then all of a sudden I killed an elk with my buddy in Montana who was an accomplished elk hunter and got it down, you know, and I'm getting ready to turn the thing over on its back and open its belly. And he's like, oh, here you go. <laughs> And just whipped it. I'm just like, wow. And it's, and truthfully, it's a, it, to me, it almost feels a little faster. You know, I, I wish yeah. I had enough uh, occurrences to practice it because, you know, I, I, I don't get the luck to kill an elk every year or a big animal like that. You know, I, I should start using it on my deer and antelope just so I could get some practice on it. Cause it seems like, you know, every three, four years or two, three years when I kill an elk or a big animal, I'm kind of relearning it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. All right, so that's that's a great. What what uh, while we're on the topic of kind of you know doing that gutless method and getting to work there, what you know knives or tools or other gear is sort of essential for you as you're breaking down big game. Yeah, you know, a sharp knife is all I generally need. I mean, I, I don't use a saw very often. You can usually get the legs broke down on the bone with a knife, you know, cutting around the joint. Um, and so I just see a good sharp knife. I'm a, I am carry a Gerber, Gerber Gator for years that I just love. Just seems to be the right blade style for me and the right handle grip for me. Um, I've used Havilons the past couple of years and I obviously love them as well. They're almost a little too sharp for me, though, because yeah. they do such a good job. you got to be real careful. And I, I've cut some stuff I didn't really want to cut just because because uh, you got to get used to that sharpness. But uh, I had a I had a elk guide, a buddy of mine that's an elk guide, tell me that he he cut his elk butchering time in not quite in half, but I think by a third just when he started using Havilons because he stopped, didn't have to stop and sharpen a knife, and he can just cut so much faster. So yeah, that, that's sharp. one thing for those guys that are you doing it all the time, man. They swear by those Havilons, and I can't argue with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's kind of funny to to hold that and. What looks to many guys who haven't used one like such a dinky little toy of a knife and think you're going to hold that up to a you know 700 pound elk and really get the job done <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, it, it, it's pretty amazing to see it happen, and, and it and it is, man, it is slick. But like I said, that's a knife's about all I use. I mean, I don't have to split a pelvis since I'm not opening it up. I don't, right. I'm not breaking, breaking any bones. I'm not cutting any ribs out. I'm usually cutting the meat between the ribs and stuffing them in a game bag. I'm not going to take the ribs out whole, especially backcountry. I don't, I don't want any extra weight that I have to carry. On yeah, that for thing. sure, we're all about that. <laughs> exactly. So. So as you are, you know, pulling your larger um, sections of meat off, your larger muscle group, say off of a rear quarters, you're deboning it. Are you just trying to get it straight into the bag, hopefully with the help of a buddy? Do you have like a, a tarp or a sheet or anything? You're kind of laying it on until you can get things removed. What's your approach there with keeping it clean? Uh, well, when I do the gutless method, you know, I, I make the cut down the back and then I skin it toward the belly and I kind of use the inside of that hide as my working surface on yeah, that side. Roll it out. That's, yeah, exactly. So it's, I don't have, I usually don't have a tarp with me. I'll have some contractor grade, uh, plastic bags, but that's more for waterproofing. Keep my pack a little cleaner if I have to pack it out, but I have laid stuff on those before too, but it's usually the inside of that hide is kind of my working table as I go to work. Um, yeah. and then like you said, getting it, getting it in bags and then getting it up off the ground. Either hopefully hanging it or or building some sort of little framework so I can get some air circulation around it. You know, I don't want them to lay. I usually I'm usually taking them off in as big a chunks as possible. Like when I'll debone that rear quarter, I'll try to leave it almost as a whole piece of meat. Um, it's kind of tough to handle and tough to get in a game bag. You know, like I said, hopefully your buddies are helping you and you're not doing it alone. Um, but I, I I want that meat kind of in a big piece that I can lay out flat and get some air circulation all the way around it. I mean, I'm a little fearful of stuffing a bunch of meat in a bag and then hanging it because if that meat's still hot and the meat toward the center of that bag's not getting any air right away, it's just going to hold that heat. So mm-hmm. I kind of want to kind of keep that open and I guess trying to think like rolled out into a big flat piece and let it get some air before I start stuffing it into tight little packages that are going to go in my pack. Yeah, very good. So yeah, airing it out is kind of the next big point we wanted to get to. And yeah. as you mentioned, that's, you know, hopefully getting it um, into a game bag and getting it hung, um, mm-hmm. letting some, you know, cool air circulate around that. So I guess to start with, do you have any preferences on selecting a game bag? You know, I, I use a, either Alaska game bags or great ones. Um, and then there's some stuff called, I believe, Caribou Gear that works pretty well. My only problem with a couple of those are they get to be some heavy canvas which are great for their durability but they i don't feel like they get as much airflow as some of those more uh cheese clothy and mesh bags um, right. so I, I like the thinner ones i think the if i remember right the last game bags are a little bit thinner than the caribou gear one gear one so i like them for that a little bit more yeah okay and Very don't good. quote me i could be wrong on that but i think that's the way they work out in my head so no i believe you're right yeah, yeah. i believe so. you're right so then, you know, when it comes to, um, you mentioned hopefully getting it preferably hung versus kind of laid out, I guess let's talk site selection, um, especially in warmer temperatures. What are you looking for in terms of a good place to hang your meat, especially when you're battling the heat? Yeah, shade all day. I mean, you, you want that thing in shade as much as possible, you know. Hopefully you kill that elk in some dark timber, which kind of hopefully not because that makes the pack out a lot harder. <laughs> but but, uh, but that dark timber just seems to stay 10 or 15 or 20 degrees cooler than everything else. I don't know why. But um, so, you know, if you can find a spot that's shady all day but yet still, I mean, you kind of have to battle it because you need shade all day but you also need airflow as much as possible. So, you know, you don't want to tuck it deep into a conifer where the wind's not going to get to it, but you still need to get it in some shade that and that air can still circulate around it and, and that might mean moving it a few times during the day i mean it depends on your pack out and you know maybe you're gonna take it back to camp and you're still gonna hunt because your buddy's got a tag for the next few days so but you want to get the meat back to camp you know you might have to move it a couple times during the day to keep it in shade you i mean once that sun starts hitting it and that sun up in that high country just seems to be that much more intense than it is down here on the flatlands mm-hmm. um it, you know just you just want to keep it in the shade yeah yeah, you know, something too, like looking, uh, you know, I've always, you can really even feel it if you pay attention, but the the thermal effect of maybe finding a good shaded area with kind of like a low creek draw that goes through it, mm-hmm. I think can be really beneficial as well. No, that's an excellent point. I mean, it, it does always feel a lot cooler when you're along some some sort of waterway um i don't know it's, it's some sort of thermal effect for sure so yeah you're right it just seems like those little hollows are a little bit cooler than uh, than the rest of the mountainside yeah so it's always uh an interesting process at times to try and get you know loaded down game bag as heavy and awkward full meat and actually get that puppy hung efficiently and correctly any tips or tricks for the hanging process in terms of 
even what cord to use or any strategy for wrestling that thing up there and getting it secured? Man, I, I wish I did have some great tips because I, I could use them. It's, That's you know, I just use, yeah, I just use P-cord, paracord, and, uh, you know, I, like I said, hopefully you're not doing it alone because if you're doing it alone, it is a chore. Um, if you got a buddy, you know, a buddy can kind of – one guy can pull on the rope and another guy can lift, and, and you just got to get it up there as high as you can and, and keep it in the, in the position you want. It's I, I don't know if there's an easy way to do it because those – I mean, it's like a bag of jelly because it just right. folded over on itself and you're wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> so, so sorry about not more helpful in that but if you have some tips i would love to hear them too yeah i think if uh, somebody has the solution they can make some money even just selling the knowledge right selling the technique yeah. the secret sauce exactly a little <laughs> secret sauce so let's say we're in an area that for whatever reason uh is difficult if not impossible to get that meat hung you kind of mentioned obviously that's preferable but you know other things that we can do to to lay it out effectively to still get airflow where we can't hang it um, any, any recommendations on a uh, strategy there? Yeah. And it seems like this is what I do more often than hanging. Maybe just cause the situations I found myself in is just, you know, build like a, a lattice work out of whatever deadfall you can find that, and, and build the, up off the ground, lean it against a, a deadfall, and just so they can get some air underneath it, you know. So, so just build a little framework that still exposes a lot of that meat to the air, but still holds it up off the ground as well, too. So, I mean, that, like I said, that's usually what I'm doing versus hanging, or just because it's the situation I'm in. And I'm usually, uh, you know, a hanging situation to me is one if you're going to leave it overnight, and that's ideal um, to get it up off the ground, hang it also for scavengers, bears, and that sort of thing, depending on where you're hunting. Um, but it seems to me like I'm usually getting try get that meat out that day so i you know i'll lay it out get some air underneath it then get it in my pack and get down the mountain as fast as i can so yeah, yeah you mentioned uh you know bears and other predators certainly something i wanted to address mm -hmm. you know it, a buddy of mine you know we got his elk down and we're forced to leave it overnight it was incredibly or getting incredibly late by the time we got done processing there wasn't many great trees to hang it around we were just you know, I think it was day six of the hunt, just flat out exhausted. And so we did kind of exactly what you mentioned. We found two down trees that were somewhat parallel, you know, met, kind of made a lattice work across yeah. those and then left the meat out. Um, thankfully in a really good spot in terms of, uh, cooling. Um, and then we kind of had that thought of, oh man, leaving this overnight till we can get to it, you know, first thing in the morning. And mm -hmm. so we left some of our sweaty layers in that around the meat um, yep. Just to kind of give it some human presence and hopefully, um, you know, discourage some presence of predators on that meat. Is there anything else you think you can do in that situation uh, to kind of avoid that concern? Nope. I, I think you, I think that's exactly the best way to go about it. You know, whether that works all the time, I, I'll, I'll say it works on coyotes tremendously. I've used it in a lot of situations. I mean, I think coyotes are enough beard of human scent that they'll stay pretty far away. I haven't hunted enough in wolf country to say if it works there or or in a lot of bear situations, but I think that's anything you can keep some human scent around there, hopefully to just deter them. Uh, I've heard an old wives tale, and it might work. Some guys just pee all the way around the carcass as well. Yeah, he actually did that as well. I don't know if that was going to help, but we did that yeah, as well. Exactly. So I, I, you know, I don't know whether that works or not. So those are the two things that I'd say. And then if and, if, and then there's always insects you have to worry about. And uh, one thing I do, you know, it's funny now that you say that uh, you asked me about packing spices. I do always have a pack of cayenne pepper a big bottle of cayenne pepper in my pack um to to pour over the quarters too it helps keep flies and yellow jackets away a little bit yeah um uh, black pepper or cayenne pepper bowl so um so i guess i do have spices in my pack but i don't ever think about using that <laughs> <laughs> for cooking good. right exactly yeah that right. was actually actually exactly where i wanted to head next um yeah. you know black pepper cayenne pepper chili powder those types of things you know been given as sort of remedies or treatments to use on meat as you use it. You kind of mentioned it helps keep the insects away. Are there any other um, reasons we should be using that? And in your own experience, you have found using those treatments helpful? Yeah, I've definitely found it helpful. I, I, we kind of did a, not really a test, but we just noticed when we were doing it one time, we had some yellow jackets start to get real, real bad on us as we were cooking. So I was like, oh, I have this black pepper. So we spray, sprinkled black pepper on like part of the quarter we were working on and they wouldn't touch it. I mean, it stayed right away from it. And, and so yeah. I was pretty impressed. I've actually also used it. I don't know if they make it anymore. Some, uh, there's a few companies that make it. The Hunter Specials used to make something called a Game Saver. 
I've used that as well. Um, and I think it's like a citric acid and a couple other things. And that helps yeah. too. It supposedly fights against bacteria and keeps flies and, and wasps away. Um, and I, I've had success with that. Like when I killed my first cow elk in Colorado, I, we used that Game Saver spray and it worked. Um, and like I said, I know there's a couple other companies that market it. I'm not even sure if HS has it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've done some research along those lines. And you're right. It is uh, typically a citric acid-based product. Um, mm. There's even some sort of formulas if you will um recipes on packing citric acid alone and then diluting it uh you know in the field and oh. then using that as a spray i gotcha. think from what from what i've read it has to do with um like the ph balance of the meat on the surface and then that citric acid disrupting that ph balance or at least mm -hmm. hopefully setting it in such a way that it inhibits bacteria growth is that right yeah yeah i think that's right i'm i'm not much on. Uh, I didn't do well in biology in college, but I know. I know you're right. It has something to do with the pH level and the, uh, the acidity, acidity of it. So yeah, it hamper hampers that bacteria growth, and and then for somehow I think also supposedly uh, helps against flies and wasps. Yeah. Yellow jackets, so. Awesome. So is, so does anything else come to mind in terms of the portion of you know before you're transporting the meat and anything you should do strategically or a treatment or any handling tips that we didn't cover um especially when you're dealing with the heat uh what what if i might give that i haven't used firsthand but i've had enough um for cooling me in extreme heat on those days like on that book clips hunt i was on where it was hot 80 degrees every day and it wasn't cooling the thing about it is if you can hang that stuff overnight it usually gets cold enough at night in the mountains to really chill that but yep. on, on some of those hunts, it didn't. Like that hunt I was on, it, it didn't. Um, and what I would have done, I had them with me. And I mentioned those black contractor bags. Guys, will what they'll do is they'll put that meat in a black contractor bag, uh, trash bag, and dunk it in a creek and set it in the creek for a little while. It scares me a little bit because you're inhibiting airflow, obviously, and you're also introducing the chance of moisture getting on there. And bacteria love moisture. They, you know, If you can keep things dry, all the better. Um, but if those trash bags, uh, heavy-grade trash bags, if they're not punctured and you can s basically sink that meat in a cold running creek, I think that would chill it really well. And like I said, I've had buddies of mine that are that are serious, serious big game hunters in the West that have used it and they swear by it. You just you just got to be careful. Keep that meat dry and don't leave it in there for a long time because those, those bags are going to, that plastic's going to hold the heat in the meat, not let it escape a little bit if you, if you get what I'm saying. But the yeah. cool water, hopefully, counteracts that and and really cools it and i can see i mean you know how some the mountain creeks are ooh, they're ice cold so if you can you can submerge your meat in there without getting it wet i think you'd be great yeah yeah I, like you i've heard uh i've heard good things about that strategy obviously also like you i have some apprehension but you know i think it's uh, especially if you're dealing with you know temperatures in the 80s and can't get it taken care of right away i i would be uh more apt to try that than i would be to risk just leaving it out there right yeah, exactly. I think if it's if that's what your option is, you're going to do it. It's and it's a it's a good option, I believe. So yeah. All right. So let's that's sort of in the field. You know, we've covered what we need to get the meat off of the animal, get it packed up. Let's let's skip the really fun part, which is you know hiking this unfortunate amount of weight back to the trailhead or the truck or what have you yeah let's yeah. skip that part let's talk about exactly it. Let, yeah let's let's I, I i'm all for skipping all of that yeah yeah <laughs> hopefully hopefully there's some mules or horses involved in that process <laughs> exactly exactly so let's talk about getting back to um the truck or what have you the trailhead and this is specifically i guess for uh the guys like myself who are often making a long drive um, to and from their hunting area, from their uh, residence. Can you talk a bit about how to, you know, let's say we, we're not going to town, right? Like we're not going to go take the meat to the processor. Mm -hmm. um, let's say we're headed home, have a, a good long drive ahead of us. Talk a bit about a strategy for, you know, continuing to cool the meat, keeping it cool, um, and even things such as how to use a cooler effectively. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, one one tip I'll say that sounds a little crazy, but I see more and more of it. Um, I, I live right on Interstate 80 or, or just off it. So I see guys from back east going out west to hunt. I mean, in September, Interstate 80 is packed full of guys from trucks, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Minnesota. 
uh, pulling trailers that are obviously elk hunters. They got their four wheelers on them. They're heading to Colorado. I'm right between them. And I see more and more often, and it seems crazy, but it's actually a genius idea. They have a deep freeze on their trailer and a generator. So we are and one so of those they, crazy guys. That is, it's see, it's so <laughs> smart, man. I, it's so smart because if you get an animal down, and if you're going to continue, like if there's a group of you, and you're going to keep hunting after you get that animal down and back to the truck, you know, rather than drive it to town, which might be a long, long drive to you know wherever your nearest town is to buy ice or or to get it to a processor, drop it in that deep freeze and run it overnight with the generator, and you're going to freeze that meat solid. It just seems like such a smart idea. I mean, it's it's crazy because you have to haul a, a a deep freeze and a generator across the country, but yeah, it's smart. Yeah, so I'm in so. Missouri. My elk hunting partner is in Illinois, and. Uh, we usually bring his rig and he has a nice big truck and a, a yep. chest freezer that fits in the back and an inverter. And so yep. we, we run oh, yeah. it on the way out and yep. we have it full of, um, some like homemade slosh tubes in that to, yep. you know, essentially homemade ice, right. To keep it mm-hmm. cold while we're hunting. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll fill that puppy up and then run it while we're on the way home and get home and it's frozen solid. In fact, yeah, last that's... time we, yep. we had to do that, we had to leave the entire freezer at the processor when he got back to Illinois because it was just frozen solid and one giant frozen jug of meat. A, yeah, exactly. A yeah. big square that you couldn't cut out of the freezer. Exactly. Yeah. We just unloaded the freezer. Yeah, that, I never thought about the inverter. I was just to had guys to use a generator, but that's smart to run it on your way home with the inverter. So yeah, so that that's a that's a tip that I think if if you can make it happen, if you have room in your truck or or are towing a trailer, um, do that for sure. Otherwise, you know, cooler techniques. Um, it's important to get that cooler itself cooled you'll dump a bunch of ice in a hot cooler and that insulation that that keeps your ice there is also if it's hot it's holding heat in too so you've got to cool the insulation in the cooler so you're going to use a lot of ice at first even with a good high quality cooler you're going to use a lot of ice at first to cool the cooler and then get your meat in there um and and my biggest tip is is like i mentioned a second ago moisture is also your enemy with heat so do your best to keep most of that meat up out of the water or up out of the ice Blocks of ice work better than cube ice. It's whole, so it's a bigger chunk. I, I put the block ice on the bottom of my cooler and then stick the meat up on top of it and then just try to keep that cooler drained as much as possible so that meat's not sitting in water and, and you know, just getting gross. Yeah. So. so what would you say, I mean, is there a, at least from an ideal scenario, a length of time that you wouldn't want this meat to be in the cooler or to be in contact with ice? Like even if you are draining it, um, is there kind of a, maybe a recommendation on, well, if at all possible, let's get it out of the cooler and into, you know, a freezer or what have you by X amount of days? You know, not really, because uh, the deal is, is if you're keeping it below that 40 degree mark where bacteria grows, you're aging that meat. So it's actually getting a little better. You know, it's a, you're dry aging it. The key is to keep it up off that ice. And, and one way you can do that. And I, I did this last year. I took some, uh, um, baking racks, cooling racks um, that you use for baking. I took those with me to my hunt in Utah last year and put those on top of the ice block. So that way my meat was up off that ice block by a half inch. Um, so it wasn't sitting directly on the ice. Uh, and that, you know, that, that takes, you're going to have to have big coolers for this. I mean, especially elk hunters, you're going to have to have a big cooler. I had, I had two big you know, 65 to 80 quarts and, you know, a packed full of elk meat and ice. And, and I drove back home that way. And I actually stopped for a couple of days in Colorado to visit some friends and kept it on ice. So it, mine was on ice for, for five days i just made sure it stayed dry yeah. and like i said you're you're kind of dry aging it at that point so. yeah i actually i mean it's uh a technique that i've been told uh, it was earlier on in my hunting that that's actually preferable i mean some guys do that um and uh, as a way to age their meat you know they'll keep it on ice in a cooler even with the drain open if you know if you're at home and just let it you know drain and you know i have guys who swear by doing that for you know five days or seven days yeah, or what I, have you before they pack yeah. it i have guys who swear by doing that for 28 days yeah. <laughs> they they do it in, they have a special fridge in their house that they put the their deer quarters in a buddy of mine in west virginia he puts his deer quarters and he separates them by racks so that way they all have airflow because you don't really want them packed together you want air touching all through that and he swears by a 28 day aged white tail 
Wow. <laughs> Have you got- my only my problem with that is is you're losing that you know the longer it ages the thicker that I call it the rind that uh-huh. that outer skin gets you know and so you're just losing all that valuable meat to me <laughs> yeah you're just making so, more crust yeah exactly exactly so if you've ever if you've ever seen like a 45 day age prime rib and how much they've had to trim off of that it makes you cry a little bit although I will say it's a pretty darn tasty prime rib <laughs> yeah. So have you done any experiments with aging any of your game meat or are you more of a straight to the freezer, get as much meat I, as possible? I, I, I try if I, if possible, like if, if I kill something in November when it's not getting over freezing at night, but still getting cold enough that that carcass stay cool, I, w- I would love to hang a deer for a week to 10 days. I don't go much farther than that, like I said, because of the crust that it creates. Um, but if I can age it a little bit, sure. And then I'll, I'll also age a steak after I take it out of the freezer. I'll take it out of the freezer, pull it out of the, the vacuum pack. I almost always use vacuum pack when I'm preserving my meat. Take it out and put it on a rack in the fridge and then just kind of blot it dry about once a day. And I'll, I'll age it for three or four days in my fridge that way. So yeah. just the, the individual steak or the back strap or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and as long as you're taking care of it a little bit and keep an eye on it, you actually don't have to trim. It doesn't dry enough or get a hard enough crust that you have to trim. Yeah, I actually do that often as well. I made a, kind of a for a simple way to put it kind of like a, a couple nested bowls and then the bowl that the meat sits in i have i made basically made drain holes in it and yeah. so it drains into that lower bowl and then as you mentioned i'll i'll pat it dry every bit but i'll i'll typically do that and get meat out you know say three days before i'm gonna cook it and i've actually come to really enjoy doing that yeah, yeah, and I think it does. I mean, it, it it doesn't amplify it a ton, but I think it just adds a little bit more flavor, and, and plus it gets a little drier on the outside, and when you're grilling it, you, that way you get a little better fond when you're grilling it or, or pan frying it or whatever, depending on how you cook it. So Yeah. So you mentioned the vacuum pack. I, I wanted to address for sure um, the best way to um, prepare meat for the freezer, whether that be the materials that we use or just any sort of strategies to getting um, you know, the best, um, life out of that meat, if you will, before we put it in the freezer and reduce the risk of freezer burn and things of that nature. What what was your strategy there? Yeah. So, you know, I, I try to trim the meat really well up front. So I know some guys, you know, do an okay job trimming and then they'll trim after they defrost it the the day they cook it. I'm kind of trying to get all that work done up front. And then, um, I almost always vacuum pack, um, cause I'm doing, I'm usually trying to get that meat home in big chunks and then do the, the final butchering into the, into the individual cuts at home. I just prefer to do that than, than rather trying to do it on my tailgate in the field, which I've done before, but it's not ideal. Um, so, I try to do that and then and then vacuum seal it. I got a chamber. I have I have probably four or five vacuum sealers over the years, and all work to varying degrees. Um, it seems none of them last uh, more than a few seasons. But yeah. I got a chamber vac last year, which unlike a a vacuum sealer, which sucks the air out, and I don't know if I can explain this correctly, but a chamber vac, it it equalizes the air inside the bag and outside the bag and then seals it and so it just seems to be a way way better bond they're expensive they're they're upwards of a thousand dollars but and that's kind of what most butchers use but it i found it is vastly superior over anything else so if you if you're really serious about your game meat um i would look into getting one or make have your buddy buy one even better (laughs) exactly (laughs) can we just come use yours yeah. Oh, yeah. Come over anytime. And it, I would love to have people use it because I feel like it needs to be used more than it really is. So. <laughs> Too funny. So, but yeah, it, it, when you're when you're freezing meat, your number one enemy there is air. That's what causes freezer burn. Um, it's basically you're you're exposing that meat to super cold air and it's drying it out that's what freezer burn is it's a drying out of the meat when it's exposed to air that's why it turns gray or whitish um so you need to get all the air out of your packaging however you do it um i did a i killed a bull uh, to 2014 in oregon um and i butchered actually ended up butchering that one there at the at the uh, lodge i was staying at and I, they didn't have vacuum sealer. They had plastic wrap and butcher wrap. So I did it all plastic wrap and butcher wrap, and I just pulled a piece of that out that I found in the bottom of my freezer um, not too long ago, and it was fine. It's just you have to wrap it tight in that plastic wrap and then wrap it again in butcher wrap and get, make sure you're getting all the air pockets out. 
So yeah. uh, that's the number one thing. I, I have guys that swear by the butcher paper over a vacuum sealer because, for one thing, it's it's less expensive. I mean, those those vacuum seal bags get pricey, which yeah. is another thing on a chamber bag I'll throw in there. Chamber bag bags are cheaper than regular vacuum seal bags. So I feel like after about 10 years of, of <laughs> vacuum sealing elk, I will get my money back. You totally break even. <laughs> totally break exactly, even. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, it really depends upon on the individual. But if you are going to do a butcher wrap, just, you know, kind of learn how to do it right. There's YouTube videos out there that are great for it and do it like your butcher and, and just press that air out as you're rolling it and seal it well with tape and, and as long as all that air is out it, it should last uh, you know it should last till you get your up next year <laughs> yeah and you mentioned with the butcher paper um i think i heard you mention using that plastic wrap first right and then going into the butcher paper yeah yeah so uh, the, what i did on that organ bowl is that he had the guy had both there so i did plastic wrap first and then butcher paper so um, and I think that just that plastic wrap is just ob- obviously a little more, a lot more pliable. So it wraps against tight against the right. meat better and keeps the egg. Out of it. So, yeah. And then sure. just wrap it again, real, real tight with the butcher paper. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's funny you mentioned you just found some of that recently and pulled it out. I, I wanted to kind of ask you about the ideas around how long properly cared for, properly packaged meat can last in the freezer. And obviously it's not like a flip of a switch, like it's great to non-edible right like there's some degradation but what's yeah what are your thoughts yeah. on that you know a a, a, a well sealed either vacuum sealer butcher paper i would say vacuum seal is probably gonna last longer as long as you don't puncture holes in the bags which can happen um but uh, if you i've had stuff i had a piece of halibut in that freezer of mine for almost five years i pulled it out and it was perfect it was like the day i froze it um it was unbelievable so I wouldn't recommend that. That just happens when you have a big freezer full of game meat. Yeah, <laughs> and fish good problems stuff, to have, you know? right? Yeah, exactly. It is a good problem to have. In my line of work, I, I typically get to fill my freezer up every year, um, if I'm lucky, I should say. And so I'm always finding stuff that's like, ooh, that, oh, I haven't been halibut fishing for five years. Where did that come from? <laughs> um, and that, like I said, that piece is great. So, I, but I believe in it. I believe a, a well vacuum sealed piece of meat will be just as good a year as it is the day you packaged it. I mean. Um, as long as there's no air getting to it, um, it it's going to be good. That's that's the thing. It, it's surprising. I, you know, I don't know if I would say, "Hey, wait five years and try it," but I think yeah. as long as you're keeping it away from there, it should be it should be theoretically indefinite as long as no air is getting to that. Yeah. Um, so so least, that's what I would say. So, yeah. Go ahead. At least the guys who are out there going, you know, oh, it's this deer's from last year. I need to offload it to my family and friends because it's going to go bad. They certainly don't need to do that, right? <laughs> no, nope, not at all. And one thing I will say about a freezer burn meat on, on bigger chunks, like I pulled roasts out before where the bag got punctured and like part of it's freezer burn and I'm like, ah, I don't want to waste this meat. You can actually trim that freezer burn part off and the rest of it's fine. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there, like you said, there's some degradation that takes place over time, but as long as, as long as you, once you cut some of that gray and white meat off and it still has some red flesh to it, I mean, I think it'd be fine. It's not going to be the best cut of meat you ever had, but it's yeah. certainly edible and it's not going to be horrible like a, like a freezer burn steak would be. So just, just be judicious about your trimming. Okay. So this is a, a big loaded question, but I'm sure there's some listeners out there who are um, enjoying this conversation who aren't yet processing their meat themselves um and they're probably interested in doing that but maybe overwhelmed by the thought of you know maybe taking this large chunks of meat whether it's you know big chunks of an elk uh quarter or you know whole deer quarter or what have you and they're overwhelmed by the thought of getting that into edible forms such as a steak and a roast and what have you so big open-ended question but what advice do you have for those guys in that situation or for folks who are just you know brand new to this whole you know post field processing get it into your freezer in you know edible form yeah and i can i can commiserate because that is daunting and when you're looking at an elk hanging especially if it's whole or even a quarter i mean that's a big chunk of meat and you go oh and, and it's and you know the value behind it because you hunted it yourself and you so you know what the work that went into it and you're like i don't want to ruin this and my advice is you're not gonna you're not gonna ruin it there is no right way i've i've talked to butchers i've hung out in butcher shops during deer season i've hung out with guys who butcher their own meat and have for 40 years whose grandfather did it before them and taught them everybody has a different way 
So there, there is, and other people will say, no, there is a right and a wrong way. There isn't. There's no right or wrong way. Just do it how you feel it works. Obviously, learn as much as you can. There's some great books out there. Do some research. <clears throat> YouTube videos are great nowadays. My suggestion is find somebody that does it and hang out with them. Have them come over and help you. Most guys that cut meat, uh, hunters, they love to do it. I mean, it is a daunting task, but it's like, oh, you got a deer hanging? You want, you want some help with that? I mean, I love that when my buddy calls me and says, hey, come over, because it's, it's a chance to hang out in their garage, tell hunting stories, drink beer, and, and handle sharp knives. So. Right. It's a win, <laughs> so, win, win. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so my suggestion is just dive in and do it. I mean, you're you're not going to screw it up as long as you're not cutting away and hacking away and end up with a bunch of tiny little pieces when you should have had a steak. But you're not going to do that. You know, trim judiciously. You know, get that dry outer part out. My other tip is let Mother Nature be your guide. If you have a big elk quarter, that looks like a one big hunk of meat. Really, that's like I think five different rows that are all separated by seams that you don't even need a knife to cut. You can mm-hmm. use what's called blunt dissection. Start working your fingers. Just grab that, that Essentially big elk quarter. It. Yeah, exactly. Just start sticking your fingers in the seams, and you'll find one it'll give. So then just run it in your fingers in there a little deeper and pull, pull, pull. If you find a spot that maybe your fingers aren't working, get your knife in there and just nick it a little bit, and it'll usually separate. And you can almost unfold an elk quarter into those rows without even much knife work. I mean, you'll, you'll need a little knife work, but you won't need a lot. So, yeah. and, and the thing is, an elk... All big game animals, so big game animals, kind of have the same muscle structure. So you know, get online and look at and look at a beef uh, butcher uh, butcher chart, and it's kind of going to be the same idea. It's not going to be exact, but it will give you an idea like, oh, that's where a round steak comes from. It comes from that roast, or oh, a backstrap is similar to a prime rib. Oh, okay, well, you know, oh, oh, oh the loin. I know what the loin is. So I mean, you kind of get that idea. I mean, it, it's just a learning process. And like you said, and like I said, I don't, I don't get to do it as much. You know, I, I in my ideal world, I'd get to do it a lot, but I don't get to kill that many animals so every year i'm kind of relearning but i'm also building on that knowledge i learned the year before and, and sometimes i'm like how did i get that you know how do i get that hip socket where do i find that hip socket oh yeah it's right here get your knife in there and do some work yeah but that's my suggestion just dive in and do it there is not a wrong way yeah yeah i would just echo that wholeheartedly i mean that's the that's exactly what i did right i didn't know and you know yeah. i started on whitetails and everybody who i knew just you know they took their deer to the processor and all that yeah. i'm like man i I don't want to do yeah. that. I want to figure this out. I, I, a, I just want to know. I want the whole process to be in my hands. And then, you know, it just it saves money and all kinds of things and is even it, more it, satisfying. It, yeah. And I'll, and I'll tell, give you an example. Last year, um, I guided my girlfriend to her first antelope she killed with a muzzleloader here in Nebraska. And we butchered it ourselves. Her and I did it. Um, I wish I would have weighed the amount of meat we got off it, but it was a, it was a healthy amount for an antelope. I mean, pronghorn. It was a, it was a nice amount of meat. I went two days later to Wyoming and killed an antelope, and because I had to go to another trip right after that, I was driving to meet a buddy in South Dakota. I took it to a butcher uh, in that town and said, "Hey, I need it tomorrow." And he's like, "Oh yeah, that's you know." I had to pay an extra charge for overnight fee. <clears throat> I got probably two thirds the amount of meat off that antelope that I did off the one I did myself. Mm-hmm. I mean. In the middle of a hunting season, butchers are busy, and they're not going to take the time to get every tiny little scrap of meat. And I'm I'm kind of a meat hoarder. I'm really frugal, man. I want every piece of meat off there. I'm going to trim. If I have to trim some bad bloodshot meat off, I try to get as close to that bloodshot meat as I can and yeah. leave as much edible meat as I can. And I'll promise you, I've watched butchers work. They don't do that. They're 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 make their money on speed, uh, and sure. they're not doing it on purpose. That's just their business model. I mean, that's right. what they have they have to do. I'm not blaming them. of efficiency. Yeah. Exactly. That's a great way to put it. So, um, so I, I'm not blaming them, but it was just such an eye opener to me and a reminder to me, like, I just need to do all these myself. Cause it's like, I'm looking at what I got off hers versus what I got off mine. And it's like, not even the same. Yeah. Well, and another thing to keep in mind too, and a strategy that I will often use even on smaller game, you know, white tail or what have you, if I can't get it all done one night or don't even feel like I have to, right? Because mm-hmm. I mean, we talked about aging it in the cooler or what have you for a few mm-hmm. days. I'll maybe take out, you know, a third of it and then process it and trim it well and cut it and package it one evening and let the rest sit, you know, for another day in proper conditions and then finish it later. So it's something as well that makes it, in my opinion, less daunting is just that thought of having to get all done right away when in reality you don't, you don't have yeah. to. 
That's exactly right. If you have the conditions <clears throat> or a cooler that you can keep it in or something like that, you're exactly right. It's like it is a daunting task to look at it and go, oh, man, I got to get all that done today. And a lot of times I do that. I just think that way. And then they're like, no, I don't. You know, as long as I can get it in big pieces, get it somewhere cool, either in a, I have an a spare fridge that I'll do, stick it in, or a cooler, put some ice on it, and, you know, not have to worry about it and think, okay, today I'm going to take out the front quarter and I'm going to take that apart. Oh, you know. Life gets in the way. I mean, not very many of us have eight or ten hours to break down an elk, you know, an elk on the hoof all the way down to stakes. And that's about that's what it takes for me anyway, because I take my time. I mean, a, 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 it'll be a full day for me for an elk. So. Yeah, for sure. All right, so let's uh, let's begin to wrap this up with the actual getting to uh, throwing some meat on the grill or what have you. What are the most common mistakes? The most ways that we go wrong when <clears throat> we prepare our wild game? I think the number one thing, and it's the obvious one, is overcooking. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure that's why that very first whitetail I killed, or, or mule deer I killed, that very first deer I, deer I killed was, wasn't edible. I'm sure I was just cooking it wrong. Um, the minute you get past, well, it depends, but if, if you're cooking a deer steak, if you get past really medium rare to medium, if you get past medium, it's, it's to me it's inedible. It turns yeah. into leather, gets real irony tasted, that, that blood just gets tasting like iron, and it's just not good. And And so that's the number one thing is cook it right. Cook it correctly. Now, the other part of that is, okay, well, to roast, you're going to cook that past medium rare. Well, yeah, then then you're going to cook it for a long period of time and break down those tough fibers through braising, which I think think hunters need to know two essential techniques in the kitchen or on the patio, and that's grilling hot and fast for steaks and tender cuts and then braising – for that, which is you know cooking under a low heat under a moist conditions for a long time that breaks down those tougher fibers. So take that neck roast, put it in the pot, throw a little coconut milk over it with some Thai spices, throw it in the oven with the lid on it for four hours, and it'll be absolutely the best white tail or, or elk or whatever you ever had. Or take that steak, throw it on the grill for two minutes aside tops, depending on the thickness of the steak, obviously, and then pull it off and make a nice little pan sauce for it, and it'll be the best steak you ever had. Yeah. Yeah, it's so funny when uh, my wife, she was she was of the opinion that, you know, meat should not be red if it's cooked, right? <laughs> yep. And uh, so, you know, me knowing how bad that's going to go for wild game, yeah. one of the tricks that I used on her quite frequently was to always make sure that I plated it on a dark, most often black plate. That is smart. Yes. That is a, be- that is a, that's a pro move right there for a married the, man. <laughs> yeah. The, the quote-unquote juices of this mm-hmm. juicy, tender piece of meat was all of the blood running that she thankfully couldn't see was blood because of the black yeah. plate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and what's funny, and what I should mention, is that's really not blood at all. It's, 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 it's mostly water. It's just red right. tinge from being in the meat, you know. But, yeah, I, I get it. That's a great idea, and I will, I will have to use that should I encounter anybody that uh, has a little aff- uh, affliction against uh, anything medium rare, anything past <laughs> yeah. medium rare. She's so. better now that she realized how much better the meat is. <laughs> yeah. And she, and she was on to you after a while. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> you can only fool her for so long. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so let's wrap up with this. You know, one okay. of, um, one of the cuts that everybody loves, right, is a back strap and you can do quite a bit with that back strap with that loin piece. What's your, what's your favorite go-to there? Do you like to keep it in a larger section? Do you like to butterfly those out? What's what's the best way to prepare a backstrap and wow some people who aren't wild game converts yet? Yeah, cause so so my go-to move when, I, when I'm having people over, if I have it on hand, is to smoke a whole backstrap, um, whatever animal it is. Hopefully it's an elk, um, but even a whitetail or an antelope backstrap uh, smoked is the way to go. And I almost always... I, I rarely leave my back straps whole. I do have a whole one uh, elk one in there in my freezer right now from last year that I'm kind of saving for a special occasion that's coming up that I'm going to smoke for some friends whole. But I almost always cut my back straps into usually quarters on an elk, maybe fifths if it's a, if it's a real nice uh, big bull. Um, White tails uh, get cut in half, maybe thirds. I want them in big chunks. I used to butterfly them all. 
and then I and then I started realizing that those thinner steaks are so easy to ruin because they're thin, they mm-hmm. cook too quick, and you're past that medium. When you have a, a hunk of backstrap that's five inches long and it, you know it's a good ways around, you can actually cook that for quite a while, get a good good outside crust on it that's real flavorful, and still have that that middle at 125 degrees, you know, medium rare. So so that's what I do. I, I like to leave them in, in the biggest chunks possible. Okay, what kind of technique wise how do you smoke in the meat um basically i i've always done it on a, a weber kettle um i do indirect cooking it just seems like i've kind of got a, a idea down of how many coals i need to put on one side and then i put the back strap on the other throw a bunch of wood chips a handful or two of wood chips on top of those coals you know do that two or three times uh, while i monitor the internal temperature via via remote thermometer and, and then pull it off when it's still, you know, medium rare. So it, it's it's kind of a simple technique, but it, it works really well. But anytime, you know, guys are guys are big pellet grill. I got my first pellet, pellet grill this year, and man, that's set up. Forget it. It's like my my girlfriend says when I'm smoking meat on the pellet grill, it's boring. Yeah. I, you know, I put it out there and I don't have to go back out there till it's done. And usually when I'm smoking, I'm going out there every half hour to make sure the temperature is the same and all that. But pellet grills are so effortless. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, man, you you have left us with uh, mouths watering, talking about a <laughs> nice big smoked uh, backstrap. So we yeah. will conclude there, David. Thank you so much for the time tonight. Man, Mark, I'm really I'm really pleasured to be on here. It's a it's a great podcast. I'm looking forward to listening to a couple that I looked at. Uh, finding the secret honey hole that you've had in the past few weeks. I need to find a new honey hole, so <laughs> I'm going to listen to those. But I'm I'm glad to be a part of it. And uh, if you if you want me back in and to hear the sad stale of my British Columbia elk hunt, just holler at me. But thanks for thanks for having me, and, and thanks to all the listeners out there. And if anybody has any questions, uh, you can track me down somewhere via Facebook or uh, at Feral Fork on Instagram or or somewhere like that. And I'd love to love to chat. Well, that's a wrap, guys. Once again, thank you so much for listening. If you're enjoying the episodes, please consider leaving us a review at iTunes. That helps us tremendously. Additionally, if you have other questions, comments, or feedback, please send us an email to podcast at exomountaingear.com. You guys, it is coming quick. Days for some of us, weeks for others, and hopefully not months before we are out there hunting. I hope you guys are as excited as we are. Tune back next week. We're going to have another great episode that's incredibly timely. Tune back in. ExoMountainGear.com. You can always check out all of the show notes and everything else. Catch you next time.